We are privileged to have Richard Scheller, a 2014 DAA himself, Caltech trustee, biotech leader, and pioneer in neurotransmitter biology, as today's keynote speaker. To introduce Richard, it is my privilege to turn the podium over to the seminar day chair, Oliver Lausanne. Oliver is a Caltech PhD, former assistant director of Caltech's tech transfer office, and presently associate director of IP and development at 1200 Farmer. Oliver. Thank you for that kind introduction. Hello and, el and welcome to the 80 82nd Annual Seminar Day and our celebration of the 2019 Distinguished Alumni Award recipients. My name is Oliver and I'm a member of the doctoral class of 2014 from the Division of Biology and Biological Engineering. I had the honor to serve as this year's Seminar Day Committee Chair and I'd like to take this opportunity and ask the other seminar day, seminar day committee members to rise so that we can thank them for their help and work uh, for today's event. So as many of you know, each year, Seminar Day gives us a unique opportunity to hear from faculty from across the divisions at Caltech and at JPL who are pushing the boundaries of science and technology. But I'm happy to add that in recent years, Seminar Day has also given us the opportunity to hear from the graduate students and the, and the undergraduates in those laboratories helping to push those boundaries. I'd like to highlight that during the 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. sessions this afternoon, you'll have the opportunity to hear from some of those graduate students. And during the 2 p.m. session, you'll have an opportunity to hear from the undergraduate winners of the SURF lecture competition. I highly encourage you to attend these. They're a unique window into seeing and learning about the research that's happening this very hour on campus. With that, I'd like to now introduce our seminar day keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Scheller. Dr. Scheller is the chief scientific officer and head of therapeutics at the genetic testing company 23andMe. Dr. Scheller is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards that include, but are not limited to, the 2010 Kavli Prize in Neuroscience, induction into the National Academy of the Sciences, and our very own 2014 Caltech Distinguished Alumni Award winner. Today we have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Scheller present on variation in the human genome and about the exciting breakthroughs he's leading at 23andMe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Scheller. Great, thanks so much, Oliver, and uh, congratulations to the uh, Alumni Award winners. Uh, one of the last talks I gave at, at Stanford, uh, I was introduced and uh, they didn't bother to mention that you know, I won the Lasker Award. I was a member of the National Academy, National Academy of Medicine. They said I won the Caltech Alumni Award and that I was a trustee. <laughs> so <laughs> I found that uh, very interesting. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today is, uh, as Oliver mentioned, is variation in the human genome. And just to get us up to all up to the same uh, level here, I'm sure many of you know this, our genetic material is made of DNA, and the DNA has four letters, A, T, G, and C, and these four letters are strung together in a very specific sequence, and the, the sequence of our human genome was determined about 15 or so, is that right, Charlie, years ago? And uh, it's 3.4 billion of these base pairs. This sequence encodes the proteins. There are about 21,000, 22,000 genes in the human genome. The proteins are the building blocks, sort of like the bricks and mortar of a house. Uh, but the DNA also encodes the blueprint of how to put these proteins together to make all of the living organisms. It's interesting that the proteins, the building blocks that make up 
my dog's brain are really not very different than the building blocks that make up my brain, but my dog is obsessed with, uh, with squirrels, <laughs> and uh, me not so much. <laughs> so it's really the way those building blocks are put together to make our brains that makes uh, our brains different. Now, if you took the 3.4 billion base pairs and you strung it out, it would be about my height. I read somewhere, I haven't done the calculation, that if you took the DNA in all of your cells and strung it together, it would be about the diameter of the solar system. So the DNA, obviously then, has to be compacted and is coiled and coiled and coiled into 23 units called chromosomes. These chromosomes then are the, these 23 chromosomes are the basis of the name of the company that I work with, 23andMe. So here are three uh, identic uh, identical triplets. I guess it's obvious that there are three triplets. Um, <laughs> and, and these folks you know, arose from a sperm and an egg uniting, dividing into two, dividing into four cells, and then three of those cells becoming humans. Uh, they were separated at birth and joined uh, together many years later. You can see that they obviously look very similar. Uh, why do they look so similar? Because their DNA is essentially the same. And why don't we all look the same? And that's because our DNA obviously isn't the same. Uh, we differ from each other by four to five million variants. And you can see that Europeans, Asians, Indians, Latinos, so that's variants, variant sites per genome plotted, and it's between four and 4.2 million. Interestingly, Africans differ by about five million variants, quite a bit more than others. And that's because many of us in this room arose from a few folks that came out of Africa and immigrated and migrated into Europe and left behind a huge amount of variability in the genome in Africa. Just to put this in perspective, uh, we differ from our closest relative in the animal kingdom, the chimpanzee, by about 10 times more than we differ from each other, 40 to 50 million variants. So, what do we do at 23andMe? Our mission is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. Uh, how many have done 23andMe? Well, that's quite a few. Hey, I gave you kits. You know, you know, you know, um, um, so, <laughs> for those of you that haven't, here's how it works. Uh, first of all, there's no physician involved. You order a kit. Uh, you can actually get them on Amazon. You can get kits at, dr at uh, pharmacies, drugstores. Uh, you spit in a tube, you send it in, and uh, we send you back a, a report. Um, interestingly, uh, there are over 10 million people that have done this now, our customers. About 85% of the people consent, we have to physically check a box, that your data can be used for our research and that you agree to be recontacted. We ask a number of questions of people. This is our where we derive our phenotypic information, and we have over 2.5 billion survey questions answered. We don't use all of the DNA sample. We biobank a sample and then collect phenotypic data. We recontact folks, uh, collect longitudinal data, that is data over time particularly around uh, various diseases and so on. <clears throat> so what do we actually measure? So we're going to get pretty deeply into genomics quickly here. Um, we can't determine the whole DNA sequence of 10 million people because it still costs about $1,000 to do a DNA sequence. That would be $10 billion. Uh, we don't have $10 billion. Even if we did, uh, that would be more information than anybody could process or deal with, and most of the information 
wouldn't even be that interesting for us. So we use a, a, a genotypic, genotypic array. So we basic, basically measure 700,000 positions along the genome. That costs about uh, 50 bucks, less than 50 bucks. No. But we then do something called imputation. We take those variants that we measure, and we compare those variants to genomes that have already been sequenced. So by now, there are over 30,000 genomes that have been determined, completely determined, and are publicly available. So those are called reference haplotypes. So we basically compare the variants that we measure to those reference haplotypes. And then we're able to fill in genomic information based on that comparison. And the, re the result of that, as you can see in what we call our version 5, 2019, is that we measure around 37.7 million positions along the genome because of the imputation process. So we have a marker about every 100 base pairs or so. The main analytical technique we use is called a GWAS study, so a genome-wide association study. So you can see in the DNA sequence on the top, the red letter, the T, might be a variant, say, that's present in 10%, 5% of, of people. If we ask about a certain phenotype, so something like, say, people with big feet, and we see that this variant is present, as you might see in, in, the, in the cases in red, at a frequency that's higher than in our control subjects, so people with regular size or small feet, then this variant must have, and it's statistically significant, and we do this on thousands and sometimes millions of people, then the variant must have something to do with large feet. Otherwise, why would it be present in the people with large feet and not present in everyone else? So that's the simple, the simple method that we use. It's not always so easy to calculate this, but I think the, the underlying principle is really simple. So you can see how this imputation helps with discovery. So this is an actual GWAS study uh, of people with large feet. Uh, we, we ask a lot of fun things. We'll get to some serious things as we go through the talk. So this is your 3 billion nucleotides of DNA, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Every time a variant reaches genome-wide significance, that's a probability of 5 times 10 to the minus 8th. I plot it in, in red, and you can see that there are 37 distinct regions in the genome that contribute to this trait. With imputation, however, because we measure so many more variants, we see 54 distinct hits. The imputation process also helps in determining exactly which, va which variant is in which gene. You can see without imputation, we have a very sparse uh, positioning of, of variants. However, with imputation, we find a particular variant we call a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, that actually lies in the gene for FGFR4, indicating that that growth factor is involved in folks with large feet. Uh, our database demographics are shown here. Most folks are European. Over about 17% of the people in the database are of other ethnicities. We do interesting things with different ethnicities that I don't have time to get into, except for one. About half the people are female and male, and there's quite a broad age distribution. Uh, one of the interesting uh, 
set of folks that we've been working with lately are the Ashkenazi Jews, and I'll tell you a little bit about that project. Before I do that, I have to introduce to you the idea of IBD, which stands for Identity by Descent. So you see in the top row, the square and the circle are grandma and grandpa. And you can see in the bottom row, grandchildren, and that they share the orange region of the chromosome with each other. And these orange regions are essentially identical to each other because they're very recently inherited from grandma and grandpa. It's, again, pretty simple concept, I think. Um, so Ashkenazi Jews have a, an interesting, uh, somewhat tragic history. About 700 years ago, Ashkenazi Jews were re reduced to an effective population size of about 330. That's not 330 people. Um, the way to th that's 330 haplotypes. The way to think about that is about 330 uh, families. Um, this was due to persecution, famine, a disease, and so on. And in the intervening 700 years, the population has increased to about 1.45 uh, million haplotypes. Um, that's about 11 million people. Uh, most Ashkenazis reside in the United States, uh, second most in, in Israel. If we look on the, on the right, you can see the proportion of identity by descent sharing. And several of these populations uh, all cluster down at the low end of the graph. So those are Europeans, Africans, uh, Hispanics, and so on. And in general, they have very little IBD. But you can see in the green, the Ashkenazis have a large amount of identity by descent due to the constriction of the population 700 years ago, such that all Ashkenazis are approximately fourth cousins. So we were able to calculate the number of individuals that we would need to sequence in order to calculate the DNA sequence, sort of reconstruct the complete DNA sequence of all of the 150,000 Ashkenazi Jews that are in our database. And there really wasn't very many, only about 1,000, and that's due to the pervasive IBD sharing. So we did that and sequenced uh, the, the thousand folks and then uh, reconstructed their genomes and then did genome-wide association studies again, in particular here for hypothyroidism. So again, these are your different, these, this is your three billion nucleotides of DNA on your chromosomes and the significant associations. Now why this is scientifically interesting to us is illustrated uh, in the next slide. So we were able to find a variant in the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor. So it makes sense that it's involved in hypothyroidism. The allele frequency, so the frequency of this variant in the Ashkenazis is 0.2%. Whereas the allele frequency in Europeans, other Europeans, non-Ashkenazis, we don't even know the frequency. It's less than 0.01%. It's too rare for us to study. So the interesting part of working with subpopulations of people is that we're able to work with variants that are present in those ethnicities that are too rare to work with in other ethnicities. OK, so what? What do you get back when you receive a 23andMe report? Uh, you learn about your ancestry, wellness, traits, but uh, what we're quite unique with is that we provide you with uh, health predispositions, over 10 of those, and carrier status reports. Uh, these are all approved by the FDA. 23andMe is an adventurous company. Uh, we used to provide these to everybody until we received a letter from the FDA, I was not with the company then, which said, 
stop providing these to people, or we're going to put you all in jail. Uh, so we stopped. Uh, <laughs> and we worked with the FDA to have these reports then approved. And, you know, this was an interesting process because there had never been anything like this. We couldn't go to the, like you do when you make a drug, you can't go to the FDA website and see what you're supposed to do in order to get these approved because nobody had ever done this before. So what we need to do in order to get these approved is to, to you know, I think reasonably, demonstrate the analytic validity that our measurement actually is accurate. And that's fairly easy to do, and they are accurate. Um, but also, interestingly, we write a report, and you read the report when you get your information back. And remember, I said there's no physician involved in this. So we had to demonstrate that people, after people read the report, that they understood the report. So folks read the report, and then they, they take a test, and they have to score 90% or higher on the test before we can receive approval to make this generally available. And this has to be done uh, at, with folks with an eighth grade education or higher. I would say most eighth graders have absolutely no problem with this. Um, <laughs> as people my age without a technical background that have some difficulties sometimes, but we're very good at uh, writing these and obviously it works out. So what are the kinds of things that we report? This is a, a report for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's a variant in the, a gene called ApoE4, and if you're a homozygote, you have a pretty reasonable chance of having Alzheimer's by the time you're 80. But the one I'm most proud of is that last year, we returned results to thousands of people informing them that they contain uh, the mutants in the BRCA gene which significantly predispose them to having breast or ovarian cancer. Thousands of people who didn't know, the people wanted to know, you know, nobody has to do this, and we asked several times, are you sure you want to know this? And uh, I said yes. And um, even for men, this is a dramatic result to receive. I mean, every man has a mother. M many men have daughters. And there's a 50% your mother or daughter would have the gene if you do. So this ramified through you know, many, many thousands of peoples and people and families. And at a minimum, if you have this variant, you should have uh, frequent screening for breast and ovarian cancer. Angelina Jolie, as is widely known, decided to have a prophylactic mastectomy. Uh, you can discuss this then with your physician. We, of course, recommended that, you, and, and everybody does, no matter which way you receive this information, that you confirm the result and, uh, and so on. So, you know, these health reports, I think, are doing a great service to society and can dramatically affect families. Now, we also report fun things like Monica. You know, I'm German and Polish, and I was pretty boring in terms of my ancestry, but you can see that these are the 23 chromosomes. You can see how interesting Monica is. She's West African, uh, European, uh, one, a tip of one of the chromosomes. I can't see it offhand. She even has a little Ashkenazi mixed in, um, so it's fun. All right, so what are the other kinds of things that we're able to, uh, to, to see? To illustrate this, um, we're going to talk about variants in caffeine metabolism. So caffeine is metabolized. The major uh, pathway of metabolizing caffeine is through CYP1A2, an enzyme that degrades caffeine. The CYP1A2 gene is controlled. Its expression of this gene is controlled by a transcription factor uh, that contains a subunit called AHR which binds aromatic planar hydrocarbons, turns on the gene, then the gene degrades the hydrocarbon. If we ask, does drinking a caffeinated beverage usually make you jittery, restless, or full of nervous energy, what do we find? So there's the, there's the GWAS. It's the SIP. It's the gene, it's the gene encoding the protein that degrades caffeine. 
if we ask, does heavy, heavy caffeine drinkers uh, report drinking several caffeinated drinks per day? This is a blow up now, not of all three billion base pairs. This is a blow up of one of the regions of one of the chromosomes. But you can see that the association is above AHR, which is the transcription factor that turns on the gene that encodes the protein that degrades the caffeine. So we're able with these very simple questions to see biochemical pathways. Another analytic strategy that we use is called a FIWAS. Here we take variants in known genes and ask what phenotypes are associated with those variants. Here's an example of a FIWAS where we see variants in, again, in the CYP1A2 gene. And we see that, yes, caffeine does make you jittery. It's the, the uh, dark red. And therefore, within a column, the colors are significant. So going in the opposite direction, no, I'm not a heavy caffeine drinker. And that, by the way, is me. I mean, this is many, many people, but that is my phenotype. I don't drink caffeine because I get jittery. So one of the most fun examples is really related to uh, someone at Caltech. I bet many people in the audience know who this is. Uh, this is Seymour Benzer, who was a professor at Caltech for many years, um, during the time that Charlie and I were graduate students here. I'm sure we, we often saw him walking around the, the hall. He always put on a lab coat every day and walked through the hallways. Um, and he you know, made so many discoveries, including understanding that the genetic code um, that encoded proteins was a triplet of base pairs. But one of the other things that he did, it's quite remarkable, was to take flies and put them in the dark. And he found that even in the dark, they're active. They run around and do whatever flies do, you know, eat and mate and fly around you know, for, for 12 hours. And then they're inactive for 12 hours. Then he mutagenized the flies. And he found some flies would be active for 16 hours. And some flies would be active for eight hours. And he, they mapped the gene with his student, Ron Kanapka. They mapped the gene, and they called this the period gene, PER. And this led to the beginning of the studies of circadian rhythms, for which one of Seymour's students and other people received the Nobel Prize a few years ago. I mean, it's a shame that he had passed away, because he really, he really invented the whole field. But these folks then mapped out the circadian rhythm machinery that operates in all animals, including humans. So we ask, are you a morning person or a night person? And what do you see? There are three per genes in humans, but you can see that we see a very strong association, so a p-value of 10 to the minus 19th, uh, with per. So with this very simple question, we're taken right to the heart of the circadian rhythm machinery in humans. I mean, it's amazing. We don't even define what a morning person is. You know, you define it for yourself. So I hope you can see the power of the genetics that uh, we're able to do at, you know, around the world nowadays, uh, given the uh, tremendous understanding of our genomes. Just two other things quickly. So one of the things we worried about is all of our data is self-reported. We've compared our data to uh, studies that have been done where people have been diagnosed uh, by going into hospitals and so on by physicians, and we replicate that data very accurately. Uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is that because of the large numbers of people in our database, we're able to gain insights that other people have not been able to see. Nobody's ever been able to find associations. Uh, with the risk of major depression in individuals of European descent. However, we were because we have so many folks, again, in the database. We found uh, 15 genetic loci associated with, gen with uh, depression. So I'm using this information to try and find therapeutic targets 
which I'll end on extremely quickly. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we use the 23andMe data to, disco to discover novel targets and are attempting to develop effective therapies. You can see that in our database we have huge numbers of people, over 100,000 with non-skin cancer, you know, 700,000 with depression, 800,000 cardiovascular disease, 100,000 psoriasis, you know, et cetera. So here's an example, should be used to these by now, of uh, our data identifying IL-23, that's one of the building blocks, that's a protein, one of the building blocks of our cells, our bodies. And this IL-23 is the target of a recently approved drug by J&J. By &J. So as an example, we see an association with psoriasis in a GWAS, shown on the left, and associations with, I can't read them, ulcerative colitis, which is also an approved indication for this drug, and psoriasis in the FIWAS, shown on the right. So we've, we've identified a number of other potential drug targets that were previously unknown in our database and are working on developing therapeutics with these as the therapeutic target. Uh, these are anonymized because uh, we haven't publicly disclosed them yet. So here is a novel target that again associates with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Here's a, a novel target that associates with with asthma, and, and so on. So hopefully, uh, in the future, we'll be able to tell you about some of the successes that come from this approach. If a, if a drug target is associated with human genetic data, there's an over two-fold increase in the probability that a drug made against this target will actually result in a therapeutic that shows to be, uh, that proves to be efficacious. You know, that may not sound like a lot, but it costs over $2 billion to make each drug nowadays. Uh, the reason it costs so much is that the, the drug that eventually ends up working, the cost of the drug that eventually ends up working has to be burdened with all of the failures. So we could cut the, you know, if this all holds up, we could cut the cost of, uh, making drugs essentially in half by using this approach. So I'll end there and just acknowledge all of our 23andMe customers, uh, many of you, particularly those of you that consent to participate in research, all of the employees at 23andMe and the research and therapeutic team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scheller. Um, Thanks for being a part of our Seminary Day program, and thank you for confirming my propensity to drink a lot of caffeine. Um, and also, thanks to my 23andMe kit, I learned that my uh, maternal grandfather, who was from Sicily, was actually more Middle Eastern and Turkish than Italian, which uh, opened a whole bunch of interesting questions uh, in our family genealogy. Um, I look forward to my children also being able to take the test at some point and use the information for therapeutics. Hopefully they will live long and happy lives as a result. Um, as you can imagine, Seminar Day and Reunion Weekend is the culmination of a lot of hard work by our Alumni Association staff, our Development and Institute Relations staff, many, many, many departments and people on campus, and by the Seminar Day Committee. These individuals are highly dedicated to Caltech and to you, Caltech alumni, and that's what makes a weekend like this possible, so please join me in thanking all of them for all of their hard work. And I'll again remind you, like Oliver said, uh, please don't miss the opportunities to learn from the students and the cutting edge student research that they're doing. There's a graduate student poster session at Beckman Institute during the lunch break, which is almost now. Uh, you can hear the surf lecture series at 2 p.m. Check your schedule for the location of that. And the graduate student spotlight talks are at 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. this afternoon. 
With that, I thank you all so much for coming to Alumni Reunion Weekend and the 82nd Annual Seminar Day. It's truly an honor to have you back on campus. Please go out and enjoy lunch on the mall and enjoy the rest of your time here. Thank you very much.